Welcome everyone. My name is Judd Hendricks and I want to welcome you to our Enneagram community of practice. This has been a, a community that's been meeting, gosh, uh, pretty early on, maybe since April uh, when COVID hit. And uh, we meet to talk about all things Enneagram. And uh, we meet Fridays at uh, 12 o'clock. So would invite you to join us. Those of you that are uh, on Zoom, we have some um, really fabulous Enneagram fours today or this fall we're doing a series where each day each Friday we take a different number and do a deep dive and today we are on the Enneagram four the individualists um, and I want to thank Kit and Julie for joining we're gonna um, as our tradition is uh, I'll do a little PowerPoint uh, information stuff on the fours and then we'll turn it over to them to share what's called the narrative tradition of Enneagram work where we listen to uh, people who identify with that number share about themselves and I think that's one of the most helpful ways to learn about the Enneagram uh, and it also makes it uh, much more personal um, and a chance to to be in dialogue with some uh, people who identify with that Enneagram number so I want to welcome you all. If you're joining us on Facebook, um, welcome. And uh, feel free to uh, add a comment or a chat in the uh, comment section, the chat section. Uh, and I'll bring in those questions. If you have a question or if you're an Enneagram 4 and you want to um, make a comment, uh, please do that. And we'll bring that into our, our conversation. So um, to begin, um, let me uh, pull up our slides here for the Prezi that we're using. I'm also always willing to share this uh, Prezi. Um, I think it's uh, a good resource. I've got all kind of slides on here. And so if you ever want um, just a link to the Prezi uh, to, for your own uh, information or to use, uh, feel free to... Uh, email me and uh, or message me and I'll send you the link to it um, and you're happy to uh, feel free to use that however you uh, would like. So a, a brief introduction for those of you that don't know about the Enneagram. Essentially the Enneagram is a personality profile that um, it has nine different personality types uh, and the idea behind the Enneagram is it um, as far as a personality typology, it's looking at the structures uh, in, our, in our psyches or in our brains that uh, influence what we perceive and how we behave. And the idea, um, and we can have some conversation about this, do you come into the world with your Enneagram number or is, that all nat is it all nurture? It's the nature nurture question. Whatever you feel about that, the idea is that in early childhood, we begin developing these patterns of perception, what we're aware of and how we're aware of it. And then um, we develop uh, a predisposition to certain behaviors as well. So what we look at in the Enneagram is how did our early childhood environment or what we came into the world with predispose us to certain types of things that we're aware of and then to certain kinds of actions. And those become kind of ingrained or they become patterns that create our personality. Um, what the Enneagram does is it, it looks at some of those early ways in which uh, as children we tried to thrive and survive. And um, we, we look at that from a very non-judgmental perspective. It's not a matter of right or wrong. It's just a matter of what did we put in place in order to, uh, to try to thrive and survive as children. The challenge becomes those patterns um, may not serve us in later life. And that to, to grow... Um, means that we're able to become aware of more of reality, more of what's happening in a situation, and we're able to respond more freely, um, not necessarily out of pattern behavior. 
And so um, while we'll show that, that you don't change Enneagram numbers, in other words, you're not a mix of two, you know, it's not like the Myers-Briggs personality where you're kind of a mix of things. Um, the, the Enneagram really says that you had a, a core personality fixation that the very way in which you came into understanding yourself as a separate being is connected to this dynamic of um, your personality type. So you don't, you don't necessarily change types. We'll show that there is some movement in the Enneagram. You're not just a number, you have a wing, you go to different numbers when you're integrating or under stress. So there's a lot of movement in the Enneagram, but you really are um, trying to focus in on your core number because that core ego fixation not is, has a lot to do with who you are as a person. Now you can be healthy. And that's one of the things that we talk about how to be a healthy expression of your number. In other words, how to be more free from those um, predispositions towards perception and behavior. Um, but you're still um, working within a core number uh, and we'll talk about that. So that's kind of the Enneagram uh, as, a, as a whole. We've been looking, um, we started a couple of weeks ago with the one uh, and then last week we did the three and so now we're down to the four. So what I wanna show you is we're in what we call the heart image triad. The Enneagram is divided into three triads, the head, the heart, and the gut. And I'll show you a slide on that. Um, so we're over here in the two, the three, and the four. And so each of these types is working out with emotion and issues of their image. And they do that all differently. Um, the two it, uh, goes out with their emotions. They're the most outwardly expressive with their emotions. The threes are the most ambiguous and in some ways the most cut off in this triad from their emotional life. And the fours go inward with their emotions. So um, just want you to remember that we are in the heart trad. That, that is where their uh, fixation is, is around emotion and around image. Um, and they all do that differently. So let's look at, um, again, I've got some slides of, of characteristics or what we would call stereotype caricatures, uh, caricatures of uh, these numbers. The four is called uh, the individualist or the, the tragic romantic. Um, so let's look a little more uh, at some of the details of the four. And um, what we'll do is look at this a little bit, and then I'll ask uh, some of our, our Julie and Kit to jump in and, and share some about how they experience themselves as fours. The four is the individualist. They often um, report that um, fours have a really rich emotional life, an inward emotional life. And um, they... Um, Sometimes the early childhood environment of the fours, um, again, the, these are all different, but uh, children of fours often feel like they came into the world, like sometimes like a spaceship may have dropped them down into their family. Like from a really early age, they kind of feel themselves set apart or different um, than those that are around them. And, um, so uh, early childhood environments of the four, sometimes they report that, yeah, they just never really felt connected. A lot of teenager fours uh, really have struggle with anger towards their parents. Uh, they, don't, they, they don't ever really feel understood by people, including their, their family or their, their parents. And so, um, Fours with their kind of rich emotional life um, uh, are very creative people. And so when we look up here uh, at the levels, um, uh, at their healthiest levels, they really are inspired, creative people. They're able to, um, they're very intuitive in the sense that they have a, a rich sense of who they are um, 
And when they're, they're healthy, they can express these really deeper emotions or these deeper ideas uh, in some really creative ways. And they um, find different ways in which they, they are creative, but they, they find a lot of enjoyment in expressing themselves that way. Um, as, as we can see, they're self-aware intuitive types. Um, they often uh, make good counselors, good uh, therapists, because they're aware of these kind of, um, the richness of their, their emotional life and their, their own kind of psychology. As they begin to get a little more unhealthy though, um, we can see that they move into some of the lower levels, uh, like we all do of expressing themselves. The imaginative, um, as the, the self-absorbed romantic, self-indulgent exception, as you can see, they begin to pull away in some ways from people and move much deeper into their interior life. One of the challenges with that is sometimes they really struggle to know who they are and they spend a, a lot of time because they identify with their emotions. Emotions can be all over the place, as you know, and I think fours express the, the full range of emotional experiences. And sometimes they can have those experiences um, right after each other. So um, when you identify yourself with your emotions, you could see how that could lead to a, a losing a sense of the, the solidity of oneself. And fours often report that, um, they don't sometimes don't feel like they have a solid self um, that um, and that becomes a, a point of sometimes um, depression, sadness, confusion, um, and not really knowing who they are, not knowing um, that they even get themselves. They often feel like other people don't get them. And there's, a, there's kind of a, sometimes some enjoyment around that. But there's also a sense maybe I don't know who I am. Um, a confusion around their own identity that in, uh, uh, if that continues on can lead to a sense of being alienated, depressive, as we see, emotionally tormented. Um, that they always feel like they're on the waves of these emotions. Um, they're kind of uh, taken over at times by their emotional life. One of the challenges for fours is what's called equanimity. So like equanimity is balance. And, um, and fours report that they actually don't like balance sometimes. They actually like their roller coaster ride. Um, so inviting them to, to create equi uh, equanimity, a sense of, of balance, sometimes is both challenging for fours and um, they feel like they lose some of their creativity or they lose some of their depths and heights if they are invited to be or need to be equitable or like, not equitable, but equanimity, kind of have this middle bandwidth. Um, and again, at, at, for all of us at our lower levels, we move into kind of alienation and self-destructive uh, personalities. Fours do tend to have um, higher levels of suicide, higher levels of deep depression. Um, in their, uh, in some of the, um, they can move into what we would call bipolar disorder. So, you know, if we want to put a, 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 a DSMR uh, title, which sometimes are helpful, sometimes not helpful, um, but bipolar disorder, um, manic um, depressive types. Again, when they move into unhealthy, you can see that um, that could be a, a tendency that fours have um, in their unhealthy places. But again, at, when fours are healthy, when they have a sense of the, the solidity of them themselves, they become you know, extroverted expressive types uh, that really are the creative geniuses of our world. Um, moving towards in the level down here at the bottom direction of integration and disintegration, fours move to a one in their integration. And that looks like a, a four, um, really fours uh, can be great social reformers like ones. And, and it's, a, it's a four that has 
has some of the logical abilities of a one. Um, they've identified and cultivated their thinking side, which provides kind of a grounding for them. And then they can order their life out of some, some deeper principles. They can set goals for themselves instead of just being kind of a wash in their emotional life. There's an anchor that they have at one that looks like ones, you know, ones are very orderly. Um, there's also a, a, an other be, being able to see the other at a one um, because they have a sense of their own security. They can, they can begin to, um, be social reformers. They can um, and, uh, move outside of themselves in changing systems and structures. So a one, a four to one kind of looks like Bono. You know, Bono uh, is this great four, uh, but you know, he turned, he turned that energy into social change and has been a, you know, a great advocate for, for change in the world. And fours that, you know, kind of move into that social change place is a really good place for a four because um, they have some solidity of their own identity. Um, they can move forward, set goals, um, be engaged in, in social transformation. Fours at a two, which is a really interesting dynamic. This happens with uh, fives as well, but fours go to, uh, in their integration and disintegration, they go to numbers that are next to each other. But what that looks like for a four is often um, under stress, fours can become kind of codependent in their relationships because they really start relying on individuals that are close to them because sometimes a four can get so disconnected from people um, that they begin feeling the need to really connect with other individuals. Usually it's not a lot of people, but it's a few people that they become kind of emotionally dependent upon uh, to help them work with and through their, their emotional life. And especially if they've become um, isolated uh, because of their um, depressive or emotional state, uh, they can begin to move into codependent relationships with other people. And then they often get disappointed in those relationships as well because um, fours have this beautiful romantic imagery that they do. They can, um, and they like to live in this imagined world. Um, so they can go into their rooms, they can imagine a world that would, you know, be just be rich and perfect and great. And one of the challenges with fours is then they have to move into reality with real people. And sometimes that can be really disappointing. It's like, oh, I'd rather live in my fantasy world about relationships or my fantasy world about the world that I, I want to see. But if I have to move into a real world, that can be really disappointing. Um, so um, they can also have some challenge with relationships when those get real and in some ways reinforce their sense of, well, nobody really does get me. So I'm just going to go back into my, my uh, individual world. That's much safer for them. It's a, it's kind of a, the, I, um, here's just a little, like I love fours as a seven fours are fascinating to me because there's always an experience with a four. Like I never know where, you know, the, um, and I think fours think sevens just kind of float around and are unrealistic and flighty and don't get it. I think fours think that about a lot of people. Like if everybody really got it, they would be as sad and concerned as I am. That everybody else just kind of skates around on the surface. You know, that's kind of fours critique of people, which in some ways is true. Um, but they're always, they always kind of, you know, the, um, a sense of melancholy. Fours like melancholy because it feels rich. You know, it's not real happy. It's not necessarily depressive. It's just, it's just rich, you know. So a, a four sitting around with a glass of wine, reading poetry, drink, eating chocolate or something like that with a, um, just, I think that sounds like a good Friday night for a four. And, uh, you all can correct me if I'm wrong, um, Julie and Kit, but like those are kind of the, I think the experiences that fours um, think about, fantasize about, have an imaginative world about, um, which again, in some ways, right, is beautiful because um, they can express that in beautiful art and beautiful song. 
um, and um, invite us into some of the deeper emotions of what it means to be human. Um, over here, um, the uh, instinctual variants, and we've talked about this. This is the SP is the, the um, uh, self-preserving type. And those, so fours that are self-preserving are more interested in their own physical needs. That's one of the things that's really important to them. And so they can be the sensualists. Fours do kind of like that, um, the tactile stuff of life, you know, creating beautiful environments for themselves or um, having clothing that shows off their individuality, but also has a kind of a sense of style to it. Uh, and when we look at four with the three wing, the aristocrat, um, fours uh, with a three wing are probably more extroverted than fours with a five wing. Um, they can be interested and concerned about what people think about them. They're usually more concerned about their place, uh, how people view them. A four with a five, they don't care about that as much. They really do like their time alone. Um, so that's a difference between the four with a three, which is an extrovert, um, and a four with a five, which really is more introverted. Um, and they're the bohemian. You know, they're the ones that really can uh, go into some of the deeper. Um, they, you know, they have that characteristic of the five, which is the observer. They're a little more rational about things, um, but they can really write like fours with fives, I think, are great poets because they um, they have this ability to express their inner life in really rich ways. So. I know a lot of poets that I think are probably four or fives. Um, and four or threes are a little more extroverted. They're, they're concerned about um, their, their place in society a little bit more. Um, they can like the finer things, you know. Four with fives, I think um, like France is a good four with a three wing. You know, because they wear ascots. Like, who wears ascots? I mean, only fours. Fours with three wings are the only people that... If, if you're wearing an ascot, I know you're a four. You know, I, who else wears those? I like scarves, you know, but scarves are not quite cool enough for a four. Um, maybe, I don't know. We'll have to see. But I, I, men that wear ascots, I think, are fours. And some like of those hats. There's certain hats that fours wear, four men wear. That's I'm just throwing that out there. That may not be true at all. So I'll, I'm a, I'm open to some critique on Facebook about my assumptions of fours. Um, the sexual, uh, looking back at the instinctual variants, the sexual uh, four, or what we would call the interpersonal four, um, infatuation could be. Uh, um, again, the four's ability to project kind of a romantic ideal onto people um, and, and really live out of that projection rather than other reality. But you can see how infatuation, fours do have a sense a lot of times of being jealous that uh, they feel like other, everybody else fits in, everybody else knows their place, but they don't. And there can be some sadness around that, but they also kind of like it that they don't fit in. So we sometimes talk about them as rubber band, like sometimes they're really involved in a group uh, and then all of a sudden you realize they're on the outside of the group. So committing over a long period of time to a group sometimes can be hard for fours. Um, one, because they get disillusioned with the group when it gets you know, real. And the other is there's part of them that really doesn't wanna be a part of the group. They kind of have this love hate with fitting in and not fitting in. Um, nobody ever gets me, uh, but they also create behaviors where people don't really get them. Um, so it's kind of this interesting um, dynamic. The social type, the SO here is called the outsider, which again, you know, shows they're um, putting themselves on the outside of a group um, for different reasons. Um, so uh, Kit and Julie, I'm going to turn it over. Before I do that, let's look at some of the um, famous fours, like here are famous fours. 
Prince is a famous four. Oh my gosh, what a great four. James Dean, Alanis Morissette, Jackie Onassis, right? Just really um, fabulous people. Um, so thankful for our fours in the world. They, pro they provide so much entertainment for the rest of us. I hate to say that for, or you, fours probably like that. I don't know. But you guys do. You're very entertaining to try to, to, to get and be with. Um, let's do one more. Here's the dinner party. I don't know if y'all have seen the dinner party, the, what people are thinking at a dinner party. Um, our fours, cheap caviar, shocking. Maybe that's what they think. But these are, I like this one, the dinner party thoughts. This is the aristocrat. This is the cheap caviar. This is the four with a three wing. Sitting by cats. You know, I, had, I, I, did, I put out something on Enneagram and it was true. I mean, over Facebook, I put out a post that said I had a theory that fours like cats. Because I think a cat is a four animal. That's why I think dogs are like threes or twos, but cats are fours because they're moody. I don't really never know if a cat likes me or not. Like, I think they might. And then, no, just when you start opening up your heart, the cat's like, no, I don't really need you. I don't really care about you. I'm not saying that fours do that to me, but. I think cats are for, and it was true. Like I put it out. I, I, I don't, I, I should have pulled up that, but like twos and fours have cats. So maybe Julie and Kit, y'all can talk about whether you like cats or not. Maybe you have cats. All right. I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm going to stop this, the screen share. We can come back to some of this, but um, this is the real fun part. Um, Kit and Julie, um, Welcome. Thank you all for being willing to be twos. Uh, I mean, be, be fours on our Enneagram panel. So I want to turn it over to you guys, um, whoever wants to jump in. And again, the idea is share what you identified with, what you didn't identify with. Um, if you can talk a little bit about, to whatever degree you're willing, like how your early childhood environment you think might have helped create those predispositions, that's always, again, one of the things of compassion with the Enneagram is we're always wanting to see each other as young children that are trying to survive and thrive in early childhood environment, right? That's the only way I can make sense of or have compassion for Trump. It's knowing that at one point he got all of these things predispositioned towards him because of his early childhood environment. And so whatever got put in place there is what we're all still trying to live out of. Um, so I think that that helps us have compassion and empathy for one another. So Kit or Julie, jump in. Thanks for being here. Hi, Thanks. I can go. Yeah, Thanks, Kit. I, yeah. Um, it's interesting you said that about cats because I'm sitting here and my cat Fred is right by my feet. <laughs> <laughs> See, I told you. That's beautiful. Yeah. Um, I think it's funny. I, I watched the uh, program on the three last week and I started wavering and thinking, well, maybe. and then every time I hear the description of the four, it's like, no, that's dead on. That's me. <laughs> um, I think what I identified with a lot is that sense of uniqueness and aloneness. Uh, I was an only child till I was six and I didn't, I had a, you know, I had an okay childhood, but we grew, I grew up out in the country, and so I was on my own a lot, and I was just sort of told to go outside and play. So a lot of my memories of my early childhood are not about being with anyone in particular, but just being outside, and I, I from what I've read, that's, fours don't necessarily identify with either parent. They sort of have this sense that they were raised, they raised themselves, and I think that was, um, yeah, probably pretty typical. Um, and so my consolation a lot was like originally like coloring or listening to music or things like that. Um, so I didn't encounter the Enneagram until I went, I'm a seminary grad and I encountered it in seminary. And so we did the Enneagram and that was the first time I had that sort of self-recognition. So I'm not sure like what other things you'd like to talk about or maybe Julie can talk. Or 
Mm -hmm. I think you were still muted, Juke. I was. Yeah, Julie, uh, if you want to jump in, feel free to, uh, and then we'll get, yeah, yeah, I have some other questions and we may have more questions. How about you, Julie? Sure. Um, so <clears throat> I also, like Kit was just saying, you know, I hear some of the other descriptions of the, the, the other types and I think, oh, maybe there's some of that in me. Maybe, you know, maybe I'm wrong. But then every time I read descriptions or hear you talk about fours, Judd, um, I'm like, no, I'm a four. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to the point that like, as you were going through that stuff, I was like, I want to crawl under a rock right now. <laughs> because you're just calling me out. But nobody's supposed to understand me. So how do you know that? <laughs> yeah, I think for a lot of fours don't like the Enneagram because they don't like the idea that they're one of nine types. Like that's just, I, I'm much more of an individual than one of nine. So yeah. I think, yeah, a yeah. lot of times that when people give a real strong pushback, like don't box me in, I start thinking, well, you're probably a four. And that's <laughs> usually right. Yeah. Yeah, because as you talk through that stuff, like, there's just, like, this rising, like, anxiety in me of, like, no, no, why do you know that? <laughs> Nobody knows that. <laughs> That's not right. But then I'm sitting here, and I'm looking, and I'm like, you know, here, Kit and I both with our colorful scarves on. <laughs> oh, yeah, look at that. So that is a theme. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Would you wear ascots if you could? <laughs> Maybe so. I don't yeah. know. You were about a guy. That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do love me a scarf though. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I so I had an opposite experience in one sense of that I'm the seventh child in my family, um, and the youngest child. So there was no shortage of people ever around in my growing up, but I still always felt kind of disconnected from them. Um and particularly because there's quite a bit of age between all of us. And so I really just grew up with my two brothers that are older than I. And so they always kind of had their little thing. And then my older siblings were older than that. Um, and so I often ended up spending a lot of time kind of by myself, doing my own thing, um, lots of reading and writing things and little poetry and whatever I was into at the moment. Um, so even though there was a, a big family, um, there was always a, a sense, a very strong sense for me that like, I was just kind of my own thing over on the side that didn't really quite fit in. Um, so I would say though, I, I, had, I was very close to my mom particularly and identified with her as a child. So I don't really feel like I was disconnected in that sense of like not having a parental figure and 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 my father as well he was just he was um not as interactive as my mom was but um and i was very very close with my grandmother um and i have always called her um my my kindred spirit of that person who i just always as a child felt very close to unfortunately she passed away when i was in high, in college but um, so I didn't ever feel like I didn't belong to my family necessarily, but I just always felt like I was just a, a, a leftover kind of like last bit. Um, mm -hmm. and part of that is being a youngest child and all of your older siblings can do things that you can't do yet. Right. And so there's the constant, like, um, that aspect of, um, like, well, you're not old enough yet, so you can't get to do that. And I, I think a lot of that did build into that sense of like, I'm just myself and I live in my own little mind and my worlds that I create inside of my head. And, and that's very much my experience has always been like, I strongly live in my head. And I have all of these ideas and concepts and conversations and, and things. And I'll have that moment of like, oh, wait, that's completely disconnected from everyone else around me. <laughs> and especially when I was younger and I read a lot, um, you know, I would live in that narrative world inside of the novels I was reading and it would just be completely disconnected from everything else around me. Um, so I, I think I, I identify a lot with, with much of that. Um, I have always had cats and dogs though. I do like dogs and cats. Um, but you know, the, the standoff niche of cats has never bothered me because I'm like, I get that. I understand. Like sometimes you like people, sometimes you don't. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> 
don't know, um, Mary Lee or um, Suzanne, I don't know if either of you identify as a four. If you do, or if you have a question um, for Kit or Julie, feel free to ask if you're on Zoom. Um, but if you all want to add to that, feel free to, um, Mary Lee or Suzanne. Yeah, I'm totally not a four. Okay. Um, <laughs> Suzanne's a not at all. Yeah. Um, but I I feel like uh, I love a four, <laughs> and that is challenging. Mm -hmm. um, so, can either of you talk a little bit about? I don't know if you're like what your relationships are like, but. Um, can you talk a little bit about like your relationship feelings? I'm not trying to get, I'm trying to ask a question without getting like too personal. I don't want to get all up in your business, but um, you know. Yeah. Yeah, Kit, Julie, you want to talk some about relationships? What's it like to be in relationship with you? What's the good and the, the challenge? <laughs> Are you thinking particularly like romantic relationships or friendships or in general relationships? Was there a particular mm -hmm. angle you were looking at? Romantic relationship okay. is my. I figured that's okay. what. You, <laughs> yeah. um, I, you know, I think um, so. I so I uh, went through a divorce last year, um, so I'm currently not married. Um, I think one of the things that can be hard is. Um, because of that living in your own mind, um, sometimes communication can feel difficult, I think, um, in the sense of like, in my mind, all of these things have already played out, but I didn't necessarily communicate that to yes. someone else. Um, you sound like yeah. that you relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, there, that's why I was saying that I, I, I feel like four might be his thing because like, very very in his head like mm -hmm. he's had conversations he's and sometimes he'll even talk to me as if we've already discussed something and i'm like no we really haven't <laughs> mm, um, well, but in his head he already did so he already yeah. had like really long conversations with you about like here's what he would say and here's what you would say and how he would respond to that and but you just don't know that he already had that <laughs> He's, uh, he's tired of having the conversation. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And a lot of that for me, at least, and I, and I, maybe Kit can respond and, and maybe judge you with your knowledge. A lot of that is, is fear-based for me of, um, mm -hmm. like, it's easier to have that conversation in my head because it plays out the way I want it to, right? Because it goes in the direction and I say the right things in my head and the person responds to me the way I want them to in my head. And so we work it out nicely. Whereas in real life, I say something and then maybe the person doesn't respond to me the way I wanted them to, or the conversation goes in a whole different direction and it doesn't live up to the ideal that I had of like how we would resolve that thing. And so then it becomes a little bit of like beating myself up over why can't I resolve this in the way I want to resolve this in this ideal way I have in my head that we ought to be able to resolve this conflict between two people. Um, and so then I get mad, mad at myself and then I turn a little bit of that anger towards the other person of like, why don't you just play the script that already exists in my head? And if we did that, we'd be fine. <laughs> I don't Julie, know. <laughs> yeah. I really appreciate that. But again, it becomes, that that force can have this idealized both idealized self idealized relationship idealized world and then the there's a real hard uh way of when that doesn't manifest or in reality the way you want there's a lot of a emotion that can go with that and a sense then well then i'm not even gonna you know yeah. it's just not worth trying it's so hard to make reality fit what i've already fantasized about can, can you Oh, it's, go ahead, Julie. Yeah. I was going to say, because it's so disappointing. Yeah. Right? Because there's this ideal, and then I didn't get to the ideal, and it doesn't match, and then I'm crushed with the disappointment of that, and I hate being disappointed, and so I'll do things to avoid just being disappointed, mm. because I hate that feeling of it so much, 
And it's so overwhelming to me to feel disappointed and particularly in someone that I love. I hate being disappointed in the people I love. And so then it becomes this like ball of self-loathing that I didn't do something right. And so there's all of that that's all underneath this, like what should have been a simple conversation of like, hey, I'm upset because I thought you ignored me or whatever it is, becomes this like, I've created this mountain of this problem that honestly wasn't a mountain. And, and that's on me because that's how I respond. That's but beautiful. But also taking me a long time to understand that. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot yeah. of things. Kit, what, 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 jump well, in. I think Julie is a much healthier four than I've been for most of my life. <laughs> I think uh, one of the things I'm aware of, and I, I think it's something I really have to take into consideration, is people have often told me they have to walk around on eggshells around me, um, that I get my feelings hurt very easily. I had a boss tell me once, he, he said, it's hard to talk to you sometimes about job performance or things that could be done because I have... I feel like you get your feelings hurt easily. So I think that makes relationships with me difficult. Um, I'm also divorced. And the other thing is I'm, um, I think much of my life, I've, I'm often attracted to people like alcoholics who uh, seem to be very sensitive people who just kind of need somebody like me to be understanding or whatever. And so they often glom onto me or I glom onto them. So, um, I have to be aware when you said that about codependency, that really, that really rang a bell. But also the thing about fantasies, I think, I think that's true. I idealize relationships and I can have an entire relationship with somebody in my head. I, I once realized when I was infatuated with someone who was not available to me, it was like I had a dressmaker's dummy in my head <laughs> and the material was this person's voice and eyes and things I liked about him, but it was really just kind of hollow. I mean, it was like this, um, thing I draped in my own head and I could go and sort of upset you know you talked about coming home and dwelling I would come home and dwell on that fantasy it's like a drug and somebody pointed out to me at one point she said you know fantasy is a mood altering substance kind of thing I mean it's like a mood altering drug so I think that makes that can make for a very unrealistic relationship and so really working to stay present is hard for me it's not that I can't express my feelings, but I'm, I'm apt to vacate sometimes when it gets difficult. So I don't know. That's the unhealthy for. <laughs> no, well, that's beautiful. Like, I really appreciate uh, you all fleshing that out some. But the, the, I'm hearing the power of your imagination, both as a really rich resource for you, but also part of the challenge. Yeah. There was uh, a couple of comments I want to bring in on, on Facebook. Um, Someone said, we love very deeply, but we're also kind of a lot, <laughs> which I think is funny. We love very deeply, but we're also kind of a lot. Um, uh, there's some comment here about um, aging as a four and some of these patterns change uh, mm -hmm. as four as age. Four with the five wing usually process internally before expressing out loud. That's the norm. Um, there's a question, do you consider your home just a place to live or a nurturing nest? That's an interesting question. Like, yeah, do you, is your home a nurturing nest? Is your home one of the ways you express and comfort yourself and express your creativity? Yeah, how do you express your creativity is a, a really great question, Kit or Julie? Um, well, like Julie said, I mean, I, I've been, I have written at different times in my life. I'm not doing much now, but I, I like to write poetry sometimes. Um, I'm not, I'm not somebody that who's home. Like if you walked in, you wouldn't think, oh wow, she has great taste. It's, it's just comfortable. But I think having certain possessions around me is very nurturing. So having a, certain books around me, um, my CD collection, whatever, those are, you know, those things uh, are comforting to me. So yeah, I, I guess it's a nest for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Julie, I, how about you? I would say, so, I mean, writing would be my primary, um, writing, photography. Um, I spent years as a video producer um, oh. for work as well. I work in, in creative areas. Um, so all of those those ways um, 
have have been how I create how I think creatively. Um, one of the things to me that's that's really important um, is seeing beauty in things. Mm -hmm. And so it's not necessarily that like you know my house has to look a certain way or my clothes have to look a certain way but it's more about like in in and this really came from my my grandmother and my mother as well and which makes me wonder if maybe my grandmother was a four as well um but there's this sense of like always looking for the beauty around me and you know i can remember being a child and we would be driving somewhere and my grandmother would say oh look at that beautiful tree that's just shaped in an interesting way and can you imagine like maybe fairies live inside that tree and then we make up a whole story about the fairies that live in the tree um and you know and i do it that with my own children and i've noticed now that they're teenagers they're getting to the point where they'll constantly like, like oh mom look at that cloud and doesn't it look like it makes a dinosaur or whatever you know like or look at that beautiful sunset or you know that the, the curve of that tree is really beautiful and and i love that because i hear my grandmother's voice and my mother's voice coming from my children when they do that and so for me it's much more about finding these like moments of what's beautiful in this space or like kid, I love that purple color. Like I keep looking at your purple shawl and going, man, I love that purple. Like that's so beautiful to me and it makes me happy. Um, yeah. <laughs> so like that, finding beauty like that, it makes me very, very happy when I can see something that, that just resonates in my soul. And so it's more about like not manufacturing things around me to be a certain way. I'm like, that's not something that works for me. But um, like I have a piece of artwork that I bought from a friend who's an artist and so i love that i love the artwork and i love the connection to my friend and that somebody i've known my whole life and you know i have certain pieces of like a, a wooden statue i bought in thailand that i just love and it says many things to me on many levels so thing it it's all wrapped up in that like seeking beauty and having deep meaning to me is is more how it is i think i i would express it sorry that was a really long answer to that no that was rich <laughs> I like it. No, I think I, I resonate with that a lot, Julie. And I, you know, you mentioned the tactile before, and I was for a while, I was briefly interested in fashion design, not because I'm real interested in high fashion, but I think the fabrics, I like the feel of fabrics and a beautiful cloth is, you know, the, the texture is important. So I can resonate. Oh, I love that. Like, I've yeah. just bought fabric before because I like the way it felt. Right. Yeah. I get that. <laughs> So I'm going to look at, um, there was a request to look at the Myers-Briggs um, um, type. Um, so here's the Myers-Briggs overlay. Um, Julie Kidd, I don't know if you, uh, one of the things that you're going to see there is the, uh, there's some pattern. Uh, the pattern is with their feeling types, of course, uh, that they definitely are all Fs. I think the difference between the I and the E is the wing. Um, the there is a possibility they do tend to be introverted but i think a three wing would make uh somebody a little more extroverted um but they uh, are also primarily intuitive types um that they uh, the difference between sensing and intuitive is how you make decisions sensing types like to take in facts and data and intuitive types like to make decisions based upon a hunch or based upon how they feel about it. They're not, they're less concerned about data to make decisions as they are about, about their just kind of feeling uh, about making a decision, what, what they should do. Um, Kit, uh, Julie, this ring pretty true for you? Yeah, so I took the Myers-Briggs uh, end of high school and also again in the beginning of college and I actually came out an INTJ, mm. which I wondered about before because I, I think that there was maybe an overreaction to in myself and taking that to other things in my life. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's probably very true that I'm an, I, I would say an I, INFJ probably. Um, my, my introvert and extrovert have always been pretty close. I'm more an introvert because I need time away from people, but I've always called myself an, an extroverted introvert because I, I like people. I like to talk to people. Um, I'm also from Kentucky, so you know I can sit down on a bench and just talk to whoever for whatever reason, um, because that's part of the way I was raised, you know, in the culture that I was raised in. Um, but I would definitely say 
the 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 in and is uh, is very strong as well. Yeah, are yeah. those pretty true for you? I uh, the last time I took the Myers Briggs, I was an INFP, uh, which is uh, it's interesting. That's a pretty predominant type in seminary. But um, the first time I took it, I came out something like a, a, an EN. T P or E N P J. I don't remember now. And I think one of the things they recommended for career was engineering. And I remember thinking that was so far off. So I have wondered whether, you know, I, I do feel sometimes with Myers Briggs, it has to do with your circumstances in life and um, what skills or traits you're, you're needing to express at that point. So when I was younger, there was a lot more emphasis on you have to be social, you have to be uh, polite and greet people and, and do a lot of things that you normally associate with extroversion. But as I've gotten older, I think I've expressed the introverted side more. So. Yeah. So here's the uh, chart that we use sometimes on fours that have some, uh, let's see if you all resonate with this, the lost childhood message, you are seen for who you are. Um, that mm -hmm. sense of really being seen. Um, mm -hmm. Unconscious childhood message, it's not okay to be functional or too happy. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting thought. Basic fear of having no identity or significance. So there we can see that sense of not knowing who they are themselves. Um, basic desire to be themselves or myself. Secondary fear of losing touch with my inner states, my sense of self. Key motivations to be myself, to express myself. Um, super ego message, you are good or okay if you are true to yourself. So that's, again, that authenticity that, that fours are often seeking, the alignment with who I think I am and how I express myself. Um, here's some, I uh, always kind of like to end or... or begin to end with, you know, helping force think about um, the saving grace. Um, I have self-awareness, the healing attitude. Maybe there's nothing wrong with me. Maybe others do understand me and are supporting me. Maybe I'm not the only one who feels this way. Um, recognition for growth is recognizing my authentic positive qualities Again, I think twos can do a lot of negative thinking. Um, so being able to focus on those positive things about yourself, the solidity, maybe I do have a sol solid self. There is something here and it's good what's here. Direction towards growth. I actualize myself by focusing upon some, some, something objective, something beyond my feelings and my imagination. I move from self-absorption to principled action. I think that's really important, um, especially uh, I, I think it's really hard to be a teenage four, and I would imagine it especially being hard to be a teenage four girl um, mm -hmm. because you've got a lot of dynamics right there that that may be one of the most intense times. And I've known some teenage four girls, and it seems like a really hard time in life. Um, because you naturally developmentally have some of those questions that fours just always kind of work with. Um, and then you've got the emotional biological changes, um, the social pressures, the not fitting in, do I fit in, uh, fitting in becomes, you know, so important socially. And so um, my heart goes out to four teenage girls. Um, I think we, uh, but I think in helping them love and, uh, and appreciate their emotional life, but also bringing in the rational component um, because I think they can get swept away. I think fours can really lose themselves in that rich emotion. And so having some principled, rational, logical ways of moving forward, I think help get fours out of sometimes their depressive states or they just feel overwhelmed by all the things that are happening. And so I think hanging in there, you know, providing some rational guidance, providing some grounding uh, for them in the midst of the swirl, I think is really important um, for fours. And just remaining in there with fours of uh, loving their emotional life, but really being anchors for them, I think is important is to continue to come back to, I'm here, I don't always understand you, but I'm, 
I'm, I'm looking, uh, I am, you know, I'm a consistent uh, lover of you in the sense of all of you, even though I may not understand all of you, I'm, I'm here and I can be a good sounding board for you. Uh, I think it's important. That's helpful, Judd, because uh, being a nine, you know, I, I feel like, like when I'm talking with a four or someone comes to talk and it's to me, if it's constant, you know, it's like a downer. And, and so just, you know, sometimes I feel like, well, maybe I'm just like too, <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm not, not being in their, their level of consciousness that way where, where they feel down, maybe I should go down or with that, if just to be with them. But sometimes if it's a lot, it feels like. Yeah, know. we're, we're all going <laughs> to get taken down, you know, um, <laughs> And I think four is knowing that we can be with them and feel with them and honor the deep emotions while also, you know, giving them a little pushback, like, okay, let's come back to some, some rational principled things that we can do to move forward. Cause I think they get stuck in not being able to move forward. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think that it's helpful to know that people aren't afraid when people aren't afraid of, mm our emotions or the need to express those emotions because often in in life at least my experience has been um people aren't comfortable with emotions and so as someone who has strong emotions um i constantly have to calm them and like because otherwise it's very overwhelming to the people around me and um and so then they you tend to live in a sense of being inauthentic with, with your relationships because you don't want to be overwhelming to them. But then when you feel like you're trying to be authentic, the response you get back is that you are overwhelming. Um, and mm. so, you know, I, I've often, one of the, those phrases that circle in your head that you have to work through, like not allowing them to own you, it, in my head is, I'm too much and I'm too little all at the same time. Mm. Like I always feel like I'm too much for everybody around me, but at the same time, I'm not what they need. So I'm too little at the same time. Um, and so I've, I've had to spend some time like breaking that, that thought loop in my head of like, it, it's okay. I am who I am. What I wish somebody had told my teenage self was because I thought everyone was drowning in that teenage cloud and and worse and as stuck in themselves as I was um and I thought why are they all so much more functional than I am if we're all if I'm the same as everybody else why do they do better with it than I do mm -hmm. now I realize like oh they weren't all stuck in their heads and drowning in emotion in the same way I was and I wish somebody would have just said it's okay <laughs> you're all right you're still functional it's all right <laughs> here's the teenage high school enneagram the goth would be the four right <laughs> so you can see them wearing their their inner turmoil outwardly and being different i don't know if y'all were goth or how you expressed your uh, not being a part but uh, i i spent a lot of time trying to be perfect mm. um and then balling up all the anxiety inside of me about why I was so much more overwhelmed by things than other people were. Um, and I mean, that went on for decades. Yeah, I think I really struggled to fit in. Um, I was in an all girls school and I think, uh, so I always felt like I was kind of the frumpy kid from the country. Um, so my way of dealing with that was to try and be funny. And also I argued a lot. So people remember me from my high school days and somebody was always arguing about something. So that was my way of forging an identity that wasn't based, I guess, on economic status or these other things. So um, I got a reputation for, yeah, for arguing a lot and being mm. very opinionated. Yeah. So, yeah. But I hadn't thought about that. What you said, Julie, is helpful that, yeah, you do tend to think everybody's feeling the same things I am and why are they doing so much better with it than I am or why do they look so much better 
more functional and more efficient than I am. They're better students or they're better this or the other thing. That was helpful, thanks. Do you think this time of, um, like what's the, and we're running out of time here, but um, like all this social unrest, this deep emotion, this, the angst, I mean, do, do Ford, does that add to Ford's angst or are, uh, are you all like, finally, everybody else, uh, is where we are all the time, right? I mean, it's just like we're going through a four period. Like, how do y'all do with what's going on right now? I I tend to identify pretty strongly as, I, as I'm learning to that one. So a lot of times I look like a one mm. because um, I get a lot of things done and I spend a lot of time creating structures and doing you know, putting things together and making things happen. Um, I think the difference between me and an actual one is that that it's all a facade to me. Like it's all a facade. I am a ball of chaos underneath, <laughs> but I can put on that out outward structure. And so mm. I tend to, to move to that um, and like, okay, let's fix this. Let's change this. Let's, what do we need to create? Like, you know, how can we be creative here and come up with some good problem solving? Um, but underneath, I'm like dying inside of like, oh my God, the world's coming to an end. And, you know, what, what am I even doing here? So it's that const it's a constant battle is how I feel about it. I guess the thing for me that's really helped is I've been meditating now for 16 years. So that helps me um, with the equanimity side, which is kind of a force strength. I also have to be careful not to watch the news too much. <laughs> I try to get it in digest form. And then if there's something I want to investigate, I go into it more deeply so I can know more about it. Um, I think something you said right at the beginning, Judd, about Trump, I think I remember watching him read something one day and it occurred to me maybe he was dyslexic and that mm. that probably was not acceptable in the household he grew up with. So he had to mask that and that, Having that little bit of insight, it doesn't necessarily help me all the time, but when I can recall that, but then I have to, I have to universalize that too, to, you know, not just him, but other things going on around me. But I think just trying to realize what I can control and what I can't, you know, and a lot of that for meditation is helpful because otherwise I just, that empathy kicks in and you, you know, you just, there's so much that you can feel bad about that you can't do much about, you know, I mean, yeah. That, or it's hard to find ways to constructively react in the world. So, yeah. Well, Kit and Julie, thanks so much. Um, I do all do want you all to know you're some of my favorite people in the world, right? Force are just really, I, you know, anytime you all want to sit down and have a glass of wine and read poetry. I, I do know that every Thursday morning we do, and Julie's been a part of this, uh, a poetry reading Lectio Divina group, which is really nice. So for Thursday mornings at nine o'clock for all of you fours out there, feel free to join us. We're also thinking about a possible program this winter um, um, called the Midnight Gospel, where I think we're going to invite people to, you know, pour a glass of wine and at 10 o'clock at night, uh, get on Zoom and talk about all the crazy things that are happening in the world um, to be a support for each other. So that might be something you all want to check out as well, called the, the Midnight Gospel. So as a typical four, I desperately want to do that, but also don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I can't be committed to it. Right, so. <laughs> well, you all, thanks. It's been a real joy um, um, and really some great insights uh, around uh, you all nuance. Some of that uh, was really helpful. So thanks for being willing to share your story and your experience and uh, helping us all be more compassionate uh, for each other. So thanks for joining us today and being on those Thank of you, you that are, Joining on Facebook, thank you. And those of that have joined on Zoom, of course, always thank you all. And uh, come back next week when we look at Enneagram fives. If you know fives, fives are really hard to get on. I have a hard time getting fives uh, on panels. So um, if you know a five, encourage them to come on next week and help us explore them. So thanks, you all. May you have a blessed day. And uh, may we all practice the deep compassion knowing that everybody is um, messed up. They're just messed up in different ways. <laughs> Maybe we we'll practice that compassion today. Thanks, Kit and Julie.
Thank you. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>